similar to Dr. Panessi losing her job over a violation of what she held to be her ethics. I'm about to lose mine, and my primary responsibility for the last eight years was supporting protection of our Prime Minister. <laughs> the irony is not lost on me, and probably not lost on him either. And as a Mountie, I always felt it was very important that I know what my legal authorities are and that police officers should know exactly what authority they have to do what they do. So I've spent a fair amount of time researching the different legislation surrounding what we're currently dealing with, have uh, subsections that detail how both are subject to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I would like to just read the paragraph three of the Emergencies Act to you. Whereas the Governor and Council, in taking such special temporary measures, would be subject to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Canadian Bill of Rights, and must have regard to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, particularly with respect to those fundamental rights that are not to be limited or abridged, even in a national emergency. I recently heard Do um, former Premier of Newfoundland, Brian Peckford, say very clearly that they have failed to demonstrably justify their infringements on our fundamental freedom. There's many, but I'll hit on the key ones that I think are germane to the current situation. Our mobility rights, where every citizen has the right to enter, remain in, and leave Canada. Our legal rights, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person, and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Section 8, everyone has the right to be secure against unreasonable search or seizure. That's a big one in the police world. And when I read that, I can't help but think of people who are not even law enforcement demanding your private medical information at the door of a hockey rink. What legal authority do they have to demand that information from you? I certainly never had any training or direction in my law enforcement career that indicated to me that I had the right to demand that from someone. In fact, if I wanted to get medical information from a victim of a crime, I had to obtain written consent to deliver to the hospital. Or I had to obtain it by a warrant for a suspect who was potentially involved in a serious, violent crime. And the criteria to obtain a DNA warrant, which I have done in my career, is extremely high, the criteria. Everyone has the right not to be arbitrarily detained or imprisoned. So when I read about the secure isolation facility, in North Battleford, Saskatchewan. That was very concerning to me. Detailed about how it is meant for people who willfully do not abide by their quarantine when they are deemed contagious. But very little detail as to every individual is equal before and under the law. Excuse me. and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination. And finally, the most important in my mind is Section 52, where it clearly states that the Constitution... I can't look at you, Piper. ...is the supreme law of Canada. So I'd like to read my oath of office that I took 15 years ago. I, Daniel Bulford, solemnly swear that I will faithfully, diligently, and impartially execute and perform the duties required of me as a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and will well and truly obey and perform all lawful orders and instructions that I receive as such, without fear, favor, or affection, of or toward any person, so help me God. I cannot be compliant or complicit with federal policies and provincial regulations that I sincerely believe to be unlawful by every measure. It is certainly not the case that the official narrative has demonstrably justified a gigantic overreach into the fundamental freedoms of every citizen of this country. The RCMP's purpose, if you can, you can read this right off of the RCMP website, from coast to coast to coast, at the community, provincial and territorial and federal levels, we work to prevent crime, enforce the law. We know that the supreme law of this country is the Constitution. We investigate offenses. 
I can't help but wonder. Perhaps offenses of intimidation to our physicians and our scientists, and knowingly withholding life-saving treatment from thousands of Canadians and millions of people globally. We are to keep Canadians and their interests safe and secure. All Canadians, not just a select few. We are to assist Canadians in emergency situations and incidents. So, in the context of the pandemic, I've seen us intimidate and arrest Canadians as opposed to assisting them. We've all seen videos. Look at our own history. Other stains on Canada and the RCMP in particular, things that we have been a part of, carrying out so-called lawful orders. Orders to remove children from their homes to satisfy a government conformity initiative, or the registration and internment of Japanese Canadians during World War II. We're not immune to the stains of history, and I fear we may be repeating past mistakes. In our open letter, under the heading "Call to Action" to Commissioner Lucky, we have asked her to direct investigators to determine if any criminal acts have been committed. In the dissemination of information from federal and provincial health authorities or public figures in positions of trust, thereby putting Canadian lives at risk. To expand on that, I'd like to talk to you about some key points that I recently reviewed from Commissioner Lucky's mandate letter that she received from Minister Goodale. Paragraph one: The RCMP is responsible to keep Canadians safe and safeguard Canadians' rights and freedoms in an open, inclusive, and democratic society. And it's quoted: "I want to be clear." The government of Canada recognizes and respects police independence of the RCMP in exercise of police powers in criminal investigations. In paragraph ten: At best, the RCMP at their best, pardon me, at their best, the RCMP embodies what Canada and Canadians aspire to be: upstanding, loyal, and committed to the pursuit of justice. How can we pursue justice without fully understanding both sides of this argument, with a complete censorship and suppression of both sides of one side of this argument? On loyalty, I would say this: We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty. We must remember always that accusation is not proof, and that conviction depends upon evidence and due process of law. We will not walk in fear one of another. We will not be driven by fear into an age of unreason. If we dig deep in our history and doctrine, and remember that we are not descended from fearful people, not from people who feared to write, speak, associate, and defend causes that were for the moment unpopular, that's Edward R. Murrow. I feel that we have detracted so far from the values and culture that form the core identity of what it means to be a Canadian. That belief in ourselves that we are a humble, welcoming, fair, and compassionate people. When I reflect on these past months, I even recognize that same failure in myself. We are divided, with both sides angry and fearful of each other, and how much worse this will get. Our language has been used to divide Canada into an us versus them mindset: the responsible versus the irresponsible, the anti-vaxxers versus the sheep. We cannot continue to allow this decline toward a further divided, increasingly authoritarian state. We need to communicate honestly and courageously. To make our perspective heard, so that others may be given the opportunity to understand. If others have not sought out both sides of the argument, it's no wonder they think and believe what they do. It is time to be strong in mind, and body, and in character. It will require sacrifice and preparation. The sacrifice will be of the comfort and the security that can be found in remaining silent. It's difficult to have discussions with people who disagree on such a contentious issue, but that's a good place to start. Courage takes practice. If you're actively exercising peaceful non-compliance, go with a group if possible. There is strength in numbers. It will be hard, and awkward, and very uncomfortable at times. However, if we continue to allow this unchecked by our silence and compliance. Then the failure to effect change is on our shoulders. We can live up to the anthem, the true north, strong and free. I have drawn my line in the sand. No more silence and compliance for me.